This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Thank you so much. You, you might be Howard Yermish or John Atwood or Pat or someone else, but we thank all of you. Coming up on DTNS, Google's Paris announcements were good, just maybe not what everyone expected. Plus, whether the Microsoft Activision Blizzard merger is done for, and Scott Johnson tells us if Game Pass is worth it. Whether you should take a game pass on. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 8th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friends, I cannot wait to talk tech news with the lot of you. It's a it's a good time. Thank you for being here. Hmm. Enough people in a room podcasting is called a lot. So nicely done. Yes, a lot <laughs> yes. of podcasters. That's what we are. Rather mm-hmm. than a murder. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That depends on how we do on the show, whether we become a murder of podcasters. Actually, that would just be a true crime podcast. Uh, <laughs> let's start with the quick hits. Apple's App Store requires uh, rules require any third-party browsers to use its WebKit rendering engine. Now, earlier this week, Google Chromium's blog revealed it began work on a browser based on its Blink engine, characterized as experimental only, not a launch bug for a shippable product. The Register reports Mozilla also hosts code for an iOS version of Firefox using its Gecko rendering engine, although that was last updated on October of 2022. In Q4, Uber raised its revenue 49% on the year, beating analyst estimates. Analysts had also expected a loss, but Uber reported a profit, uh, thanks in part to $756 million from unrealized gains on investments. It saw trips in the quarter up 19% on the year to pass $2 billion for the first time, and active drivers at an all-time high as well. The ride-hailing business passed delivery gross bookings for the fourth consecutive quarter. So uh, we are officially back to riding in cars more often than we're ordering food to be delivered. On the heels of the announcement of Baidu's Ernie bot that we told you about yesterday, Alibaba says, us too. We're working on a chat GPT-like system currently in internal testing. The newspaper 21st Century Herald sources say that the company may integrate this with Alibaba's DingTalk app. Everybody's doing it. Uh, Netblocks reported Wednesday that network data indicates Twitter has been restricted on multiple network providers in Turkey, including TTNet and Turkcell. The restrictions were put in place at the same time as search and rescue efforts are underway in the wake of that major earthquake that happened on the Turkey-Syrian border. Turkey often restricts social networks to prevent disinformation spreading during national emergencies, but those are usually human-caused emergencies. Netblocks says this is the first time it has implemented restrictions in response to a natural disaster. Elsewhere in the Twitter world, the company's subscription service Twitter Blue is rolling out to users in India, Brazil, and Indonesia. This latest rollout makes Twitter Blue available in 15 markets now. Rather than accidentally updating help pages, as companies tend to do, Netflix is actually expanding (laughs) its plans to cut down password sharing to Canada, New Zealand, Portugal, and Spain. Users in those countries will be able to add up to two people who don't live in their household to their account. It's an extra Canadian $7.99 in Canada, uh, $7.99 in New Zealand, $3.99 in Portugal, and $5.99 in Spain per month. Per person. Netflix says it will begin to block devices used by somebody outside the primary residence after a certain number of days, but didn't give details on how many days that would be. Main account holders will have to set their primary account location and in some cases may need to get a code to use Netflix while they're traveling. Yeah, th- this is how you will expect them to roll it out, like like this yeah. with an announcement rather than just updating those <laughs> help pages. <laughs> Let's look at the quick hits. Ah, we had some fun tech event scheduling drama this week, didn't we? Uh, if you recall, Google scheduled an event on Monday, and then Microsoft scheduled an event for the day before the event that Google had scheduled, and then Google followed up with an announcement to try to pre- preempt the the Microsoft announcement. Well, that's all done now. We talked about the Microsoft announcement yesterday, and the Google event that started all this tit for tat was held in Paris Wednesday morning. If it was the last shoe to drop in this sequence, I would call it a very small shoe. Uh, Let's uh, look over what Google announced, starting with you, Scott. All right, let's start with multi-search in Lens. Uh, This lets you add text to a search that is based on an image. 
If you've used Lens before, you know about this. For example, you can use a picture of red pants, and then you type, show me these pants, but in green. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense, a usable thing. It's launching in beta in the U.S. to start off. Google Translate, also getting more contextual translation options uh, later this month. This is actually kind of cool. For instance, if you write novel in English, it'll know there are some choices. And maybe from the context, whether you mean novel as in novel, a new thing, or novel as in a book. And Lens is also getting a feature to blend translated text into the image that it came from. All right, so far so mildly interesting. Uh, immersive View in Google Maps is expanding to full cities. Uh, if you had used Immersive View before, you could only use it on a few hundred tourist landmarks, like Tokyo Tower, for instance. So now you can go into five full cities from an aerial view, zoom into specific locations, uh, and in the cases of airports and train stations and some shopping centers, you can even go inside buildings. A time slider is kind of the cool part here. It lets you see what the location looks like at a different time of day, including expected weather and traffic conditions. First cities to get it are London, Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, and Tokyo. Maps is also getting more EV driver features, uh, like a filter to find just the fast chargers or uh, the ability to add charge, stips, charge stops to a short trip. Now, the big thing everybody expected, more details around BARD. This is Google's version of chat GPT. Google said Monday that BARD is being used by quote-unquote trusted testers right now, but promise it will become more available to the public and for testing in the public in the com uh, coming weeks. Google demonstrated how BARD will be able to summarize a search using the question, quote, what are the best constellations to look for while stargazing, unquote. The uh, response included the usual search results, but then Bard added a few key options uh, and how to spot them. Yeah, that, that was cool. So they're like, we're not going to pretend like Bard can get everything right. So we're, we're going to give you a few options. Uh, they call this Nora, which is named after my niece. Uh, oh. No, it's not. Uh, it stands for no one right answer. So they're like, you know what? We're, we're not trying to be the Oracle here. We're just trying to give you some options. Um However, sometimes it might mean that one of the answers is just plain wrong. For example, a GIF shared by Google on Twitter shows Bard answering the question, what new discoveries from the James Webb Space Telescope can I tell my nine-year-old about? And of the three Nora responses, one of them was, it took the very first picture of a planet outside of our solar system. Except that's not true. As NASA states on its website, the first picture of an exoplanet was taken in 2004, 17 years before the James Webb Space Telescope was launched. Uh, Google responded this by saying, yeah, that's why we're launching BARD with a trusted tester program before widening the availability. They, they want to catch those kinds of things. Still haven't taken the gift down, though. I mean, the whole idea of no uh, one right answer, that, that comes into practice all the time in life. But of those answers, one of them shouldn't be just categorically just wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's 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 an oversight. You know, Google obviously probably rushing maybe part of uh, uh you know at uh, whatever uh, uh um implementation they wanted Bard to uh, show off to impress everybody and of course everybody focused on this whole thing of like well Bard isn't ready for prime time Google saying we know but we had to do it <laughs> look what Microsoft did but you know mm. the whole point of these things whether it's chat GPT or Bard or anything else is they are just predicting one word at a time what the most likely next word will be they are not trying to tell whether it's true or false yesterday Microsoft went at great lengths to explain how they're going to correct for it getting things wrong and they, they had filters and checks and all the safety stuff. Even then, they still put in their fact, sometimes we will say wrong things. And when we do, please report it. That's how we can train it to get better. Uh, this is an example of Google not doing that. In other words, it wasn't Bard that posted the GIF. Bard created the responses and then someone didn't check them. Uh, and 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 it's it's an example of how you shouldn't rely on these things to be truthful yet, but also you need to be extra careful. Uh, and this is not a good look for Google when it's trying to say, well, we're going to be extra careful. Now I know that Google did not mean for this to happen. You of know, course, it's, embar not. Yeah. it's embarrassing. Although, if you if you kind of think like, okay, how would this somehow help any of us going forward with wrong information? I could sort of see something like this be part of. 
uh, an uh, educational part of Bard or any chat GPT chat bot like service where mm. let's say you've got multiple choice questions for students and you know the chat bot is going to surface something that is clearly wrong and if you know your information then you kind of know to say aha I see what you're doing <laughs> and I'm better than this yeah but then wouldn't Bard have to know it was wrong in order to tell you whether you chose right well, yeah, I mean, this would definitely be like in an educational <laughs> circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, try I'm trying to be like, you're trying. No, I appreciate how, that. How could yeah, this yeah. work? Because if nobody knew that, uh, you know, what what NASA versus uh, the James Webb <laughs> Space Telescope I, were saying, then, you know, we would all just be like, OK, I guess it's true. But people are like, no, that's not true. What? And so there's something to be said, like there's something to be said about human information in this context. I think there's a difference between what bar barred in the context of Google and giving you information and having big warnings that saying, hey, uh, this information may or not be correct. If you find an incorrection, please mark it here, because that is how these things get better, is a lot of people using it and then marking the incorrectness. I'm fine with that. What, I, what I'm up, not upset about, well, what I find interesting is that Google didn't do that themselves. This, this wasn't something that Bard just put out by accident. This was a gift they chose and looked at and then held up as an example of Bard working. And so they failed to catch the thing themselves. And I, I, think that's, I think that is significant. The big takeaway for me, and the only thing I would add here, is that this is a bit of a gold rush. And you're going to see the seams while they do it. Neither of these companies mm -hmm. want to be the info seeks and the, uh, you know, Alta know, Lycoses of the past, Alta Lycos, Vista, whatever. Yeah. They don't want to be that. They want to be in the front edge of this thing, and they're going to stumble a bunch trying to beat each other there. And I think we can expect more of this weirdness. But in the end, I think it'll be good. Well, Microsoft wants to buy Activision Blizzard. We're all aware of this. Uh, here's the latest. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority released an initial view that Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard would further consolidate what it called Microsoft's strong position in cloud gaming and therefore could result in substantially lessened competition for UK gamers. The agency suggested remedies to its concerns, including divesting Activision's publishing unit, which owns the studios that make Call of Duty, just a tiny little game no one's ever heard of, as well as possibly selling off Blizzard altogether. Now, as an alternative, it also said it would consider enforceable commitments that would guarantee rivals continued access to games at the same time they're released for the Xbox. That's something that Microsoft had said it would be willing to do. The CMA also asked both companies to propose their own ways to ease the concerns. It will publish its final decision on whether to allow the acquisition by April 26th. Yeah. I feel like what we're looking at here is a very real possibility that Microsoft could back out of the deal if they get too nitpicky about it. Because at some point, you have to look at that number that they offered, $69 million, or excuse me, billion dollars with a B, and decide where that value is coming from. If they force them through regulatory means to just chip and peel away until the husk is left, whatever that husk is, that isn't going to be worth that amount of money. And it may not be worth the trouble for Microsoft to have gone that far. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's where this is headed, unless something as simple as Microsoft already being willing to do it. If something as simple as them saying, look, we'll let these be out day and date on PlayStation. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to know what they mean when they say that, because when they say day and date on com competitors, are they going to force Microsoft uh, or Activision Blizzard or anyone else to put their games on platforms like, say, the Switch, which is a competitor in that market, but it's not the same competitor. That device doesn't play the games in the same way. They would have to make way uh, cut down versions of these games to work in that environment. And so there's not an equal playing field already as it is. Um, as close as you get to that is Microsoft and Sony. So are they just talking about their chief competition or are they talking about the entirety of the business? Are we talking PCs? Like it gets a little muddy when you start really thinking about what that request means. And Microsoft's being willing to do that probably means they're willing to do that for their chief competitor being Sony and not really anything else. I mean, they're fine on the PC side too, but. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff there that gets really in the weeds. And if it gets too much into the weeds and it chips away enough at this deal, I don't know why Microsoft would continue to push it. Yeah, no, that is the question, right? Because this is obviously a negotiating tactic. They know Microsoft is not going to sell off Blizzard uh, in order to get 
Activision Blizzard and just end up with Activision. They're certainly not going to want to sell off Call of Duty's publishing arm. Uh, so this is a negotiating tactic to say, well, it could be worse. We could make you do this to get the deal. Uh, what you got? And that's when they get into the weeds. And I, I've just got, I think you nailed it. The question is, can they come up with language that adequately describes what Microsoft is willing to do that satisfies the UK CMA? And that's just for the UK. Don't forget, we've got the US and the EU going to weigh in on this as well. So uh, this is far from over. That was uh, yeah. that was going to be my question before we move on is, mm -hmm. okay, let's say in a scenario, the UK, I don't know, gets what it wants and says, okay, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, you're going to have to figure out something else. Would there be different rules in the US and EU? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that sure. that's where it gets real messy. There could be. I'm not yeah. saying there absolutely will be, but there, yeah. there absolutely could be. I don't know. Uh, so, and so the problem with that is, is they need the European market, they need the Asian market, they need the American market, they need North North America, they need South America now. Like, if they really want this deal to be worth sixty nine billion, then they 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 need all they need those all markets. Of them. Yeah. So the, just to say, the, oh well, we'll just live by the rules in the U.S. is just not going to be worth the money. The 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 op, the the thing that could also happen is if the U.K. CMA were to come to an agreement, the EU and U.S. could look at that and say that's a pretty good agreement. If you agree to that yeah. here, you know, it could have the effect of speeding things along, too. You, That's you, true. you just don't know. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about something on the show and you are like, gosh, what's their email address? Uh, I, I know I could find it at the website, but I'm listening right now and I'd rather Tom would just tell it to me. Well, I'm here for you. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Nice. Xbox Game Pass, that's that cloud service that the UK CMA is so, so concerned about having a, uh, a too strong of a market position uh, because it's often held up as an example of game subscriptions done right. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, you can pay $10 a month for console Game Pass. That gets you to access to more than 100 games on the Xbox Series X and S as well as the Xbox One. Uh, you can also pay for a different plan called PC Game Pass. $10 a month gets you access to more than 100 games on a Windows PC. Or you can get both for $15. Uh, that's Game Pass Ultimate. And that'll not only get you the console and the PC, but smart TVs, Android, and iOS via the beta cloud gaming option. Scott has been spending a good amount of time with this service. Scott, how do you think it works? And do you think it's better than the alternative subscription services out there? You know, you got GeForce Now and others. Sure. Um, well, in the case of Microsoft's Game Pass, they started, um, it's been a while now, a couple of years that I'd been using it pretty solid. I'd say, oh gosh, right around the time I got my Series X. And uh, by then they had it in a pretty mature uh, format so that people could just start using it. And uh, there were a few things that weren't there yet, but at the very last minute, they added some some bonus stuff. Like if you do the ultimate edition on consoles, you get EA Play, which is a selection of EA games as well. And on the PC, just having the PC Game Pass gets you those EA Play, uh, get you EA Play access. And I've used it all. Um, benefits are, are all over the place. I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, one is all of your progress in games you may play on the Xbox if you have Ultimate will be uh, saved in the cloud and that progress will be resumable or continuable on the PC and vice versa. Um, that's for games that are on both platforms. They're not always that way, but most of the time that's true. Certainly first party games are always that way. Um, in terms of the service overall, having spent enough time with it and also spent time with PlayStation's new three tiered plus system. Uh, I've spent time with the middle tier that is and various other subscription services around gaming, GeForce Now, everybody else and their dog. Um, I do think that Game Pass is the best one on the market as of right now. And they have a sizable head start. They have a ton of video games. They got a lot of third-party content. Um, some have argued it's too much and it's hard to make a choice on what to play. My argument is uh, there are a bunch of sort of non-AAA, let's call them triple B titles. Well, let's just call them A titles that in the past, were a little bit harder to find or pick up because you're like, do I really want to spend 39 on this thing I've never heard of? Might be good, might not be good. I don't know. Game Pass is this great way of saying, here's a lineup of games. Some of these you were never going to buy because you just don't know anything about it or whatever. And now you can just download it and try it. Or better yet, you can just stream it and try it before you even download it. I'm more of a download it and play it on the hardware kind of guy because streaming you know, still has its hits and misses. But the fact that that's part of this has, has been a nice benefit for me when I'm on the road or whatever. And overall, 
point for point, stack it up against what the competition has available to them. This is the superior service for now. I think mm -hmm. that Sony has a desire to catch up and they want to. I don't think they have near, they have a lot of legwork to do before they get there is the best way I can put it. Um, and Microsoft's kind of run away with this a little bit. So it doesn't mean that you uh, suddenly you need to throw your PlayStation away. Sony's got lots of cool options and all of that. But if you're looking for the best bang for your buck, in particular, Ultimate is just kind of the best thing going. And my biggest concern is it will not stay as inexpensive for long <laughs> as it is right now. I feel like the price increase is probably coming. I don't want to jinx it by saying it, but I just feel it down the road. Now, when you say $15 per month is the best bang for your buck, it clearly is as far as options go. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you're, 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 you prefer to... Uh, enjoy a game not streaming just because there are less limitations but how many folks do you think are taking advantage of you know smart tv gaming and pc gaming xbox gaming and mobile gaming and using all of those options well more and more clearly but um i still think it's secondary to the to the way that you would want to play the most like if you've got a big 4k tv and you've got a Series S or X, you're going to download those games that you want to play. You might stream them first to make sure it's a game you want to play, mm -hmm. right? That's really cool because I don't need to wait for my ISP to download a 80 gigabyte game to see if I like it. I can just quickly hop in and go, oh, this is all right. You can even get far enough in that game to save two or three times. And when you do the full download because you're like, yeah, I want the full experience, you'll do that download and that progress comes with it. <laughs> so you don't lose anything by testing it that way and you also don't lose anything by saying up oh, i gotta go somewhere i'm gonna be on the bus for an hour pull out your phone and continue that game on your phone uh, assuming you have the bandwidth to get to the office or whatever these are all possibilities that are either not available through other services or less convenient or less built in uh in terms of functionality so getting a game seeing if you like it first playing it deleting it reinstalling it keeping your saves across the board that stuff is easy. Set it and forget it. Not hard at all. Super simple. Um, and it becomes it's become the kind of service that, I don't know, like certain streaming services that I like, I just know I'm always going to be paying for that. Now, if they suddenly said, well, we've decided it's uh, 50 bucks a month, I might have issues. Mm -hmm. But I think at 15, it's very hard to find uh, a better value in game subscriptions. And it's funny to act like there's a ton of them. There really aren't. There's not... A million game subscriptions. This is a new idea, kind of, and they're a major player with a new idea and the back uh, the uh, back end to handle it. And others who are also major in the market, be be they Sony, Nintendo, or whoever, they're playing catch up partly because they don't have billions of dollars of Azure servers just waiting for them to use them. And in some cases, they do, but they have to pay Microsoft to use them. So yeah, you know, right. Even that's when what, you, that's even what Sony's you, doing. They're they're paying exactly for space on Sony's Azure. Doing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's it's a it's a, it gets a little complicated when you get into those weeds. But this is this is the thing that they've been banking on. This is their strategy. I think so far it's working. Do you think someone could get away with just Game Pass? Because I mean, it, it, with games costing sixty dollars, fifteen dollars a month, if that's all you have to pay, it's going to save you money. Is that going to work for anybody? Oh, hundred percent. There are people who, the way that they game is, you know, everybody's a little bit different. I'm checking out stuff all month, but a lot of people are like, I'll try this one game, and three months later, I might look at another one. Some people only buy Madden once a year. Um, some people play everything they can get their hands but on. But you're but you're not getting all the games all the time, are you? You you have access to everything in that Game Pass library anytime you want it. Uh, but so but not all the titles you might want are in there, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, exactly. So like okay. there are obviously Sony titles you're never going to see on the platform, but even third party titles that don't make it there or make it there later. Sometimes Microsoft gets a hold of one and has it for six so, months. So on Game most Pass of the gone. titles you would buy for an Xbox are in there. Yeah. For if you're talking first okay. title or first party, uh, almost well, all first party is in there. Um, yeah, yeah. When I say all, I mean, you know, there may be some older titles that aren't there yet or yeah, whatever, yeah. but. If, if, you know, when, when um, a new Halo comes out, you will have it on Game Pass day one. Got it. Uh, when you have a new version of Gears of War that comes out, you'll have it on day one. The, the big first party stuff and these new studios that Microsoft has bought, the Fezda, id Software, maybe Activision Blizzard, those all show up now on Game Pass and they are a Game Pass game. Whether you buy, and you can still go buy it if you want. You can buy it on Steam if you want to. And in some cases, you can buy that stuff on your PlayStation if you want to. Um, like uh, Deathloop is an example of that. 
but these games are there permanently if you're paying for the service and they never go anywhere. There are third party games that come and go, but most of those have long lives on Game Pass. Some have been there since day one of them never left. So I'm not sure what the rules are uh, on third party stuff because mm-hmm. some do leave. But for the most part, stuff stays. And even if it does leave, they say, well, this third party game is leaving. How would you like to pay 65% less for it in the store and have ah, it permanently nice. outside of Game Pass? So yeah. they get you on that end as well. Um, all of that just makes for a really well-rounded experience with very few limitations. It's a strong, it's a strong play. Well, thank you, Scott, for living with Xbox Game Pass simply <laughs> to talk about it here on DTNS. I know you never would have subscribed otherwise, right? No, it's really my took only one for reason. the team there, Scott. That's thank right. You. Yeah. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> uh, if if you like this conversation and you want to hear more of what Scott has to say, as well as if you're like, well, wait a minute, what about GeForce Now? What about the other options out there? I know there's not a lot of them. Uh, we are going to get together a round table led by Scott, uh, featuring Max Scoville and Trisha Hersberger uh, later this week. They're going to discuss how the different game subscription services stack up and how game subscriptions are disrupting how we consume games. Uh, so look for that in your feeds uh, after Friday. Okay, good weekend listening for you. Well, whether or not you're gaming while on the road, you might be traveling soon. And you might have noticed that many cities, such as Rome, have multiple airports. Now, if you're unsure whether that airline ticket you booked to Rome in Italy is really going to land at the airport you think it's going to land at, Chris Christensen has a tip for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. You're probably aware already that every airport has a unique three-letter abbreviation that's called an IATA code, I-A-T-A, the International Air Transport Association. It's good to know the codes for your local airports. I once spent 15 minutes trying to convince someone at JFK that he had just booked my luggage not to San Jose, California, SJC, but to San Jose, Costa Rica, SJO. But did you also know that there are metropolitan area codes for some cities? Rome, for instance, R-O-M, London, L-O-N, New York City, NYC, and Chicago, C-H-I. And those can sometimes help you find a good alternative flight to a different airport in the destination where you're going. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. That is a good tip. Yeah, for, for sure. Especially London. Uh, I've used that where it's like, oh, uh, it is a little cheaper and better times to mm-hmm. maybe go to Gatwick or, or something like that instead of LHR. Yeah. Uh, that's I have stuff. to go to Chicago in June for a wedding and I know Ord, but there are other There's Midway. <laughs> there are other yeah. options. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, Chris. You think anybody ever went to Paris and went to Paris, Texas by accident? Well, there's also happened? that, right? Yeah. Like knowing mm-hmm. the codes Does Paris, Texas is have an airport is the yeah. question. Oh, yeah. Good question. You'd probably figure it out before you got to Paris. But. I think yeah. it might, but it'd be, it wouldn't handle most of the flights that people are booking to Paris. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this is a good one from Jermaine, who wrote in about an idea he's had for several years. Jermaine says, it's become old hat in the tech sector to say that Apple is nothing but iterative. But replacing the iPhone Pro Max with what I call the, let's say, iPhone X. He doesn't mean 10. He just means, you know, X, you know, because it's not been named yet. Could create differentiation and help kill that iterative view. In short, the iPhone 15 or 16 X, whatever, would be a public beta product. This would be the phone where Apple says, here's what we want to put into the public over the next couple years. Try it out. Jermaine says, as long as they're straightforward with the marketing and don't pull the Google Glass thing, telling everybody you have a consumer product when you have a public beta, thus create the disappointment that was Google Glass in the eyes of the general public, it could work. Not to mention, they generate a lot of revenue from the Apple fangirls and fanboys who would spend extra money on such a product. This is a really intriguing idea that I would love if Apple took from Jermaine. Uh, and, and as good as the idea is from Jermaine, because I, I think it's a it's a fun fun way to like generate sort you know, of a less than zero information. Yeah. chance that Apple would. Apple just doesn't like doing stuff like that. They want everything they put out to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, yeah. they'll tell you that, in fact, why it is perfect. perfect. And you're, why wrong. you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I just can't see them doing it. But I love the idea. I love this. I love this thought, Jeremy. I do too. I like the idea of, okay, let's say it's not Apple, but another company saying, this is a hardware beta. 
Mm -hmm. You are used to hardware betas, but maybe not as far as smartphones go because we're all used to the smartphone being as perfect as possible when, you know, it's finally released. Mm. Um, and, you know, if it's not, then it gets fixed uh, quickly and the company is super embarrassed about it. But if it was a public beta to begin with, that's a little different. Maybe they just see people see it as a... I don't know. Apple Apple sees it as well. Then then we're not giving them magic anymore. We're we're showing them how the sausage is made. Yeah. And we don't want to show people our the way we make our sausage. And I I just can't see Apple ever doing it. But I think it's a fine idea. Yeah. Apple you know? actually will tell you it's not sausage. It's it's a fine cut of steak. Right. Well, they'll say right. it just works. Yeah. Because it just tastes. That's us. Yeah. It but just tastes yeah, like. I I do yeah. actually. I I think a lot of people would prefer the public beta and option of this as Jermaine has laid out. I don't know. Maybe we'll see more of that in the yeah, future. Yeah, cool idea. Thanks for sending that, Jermaine. Indeed. And if you have cool ideas, do send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Sure. If you are interested in hearing more in-depth discussion around the video games business, from the big corporate wranglings all the way down to what we played this week, we have a show for you. It's called Core. You can find it on Thursday nights and uh, anywhere you get your podcast. Just go uh, search for core and uh, find us at frogpants.com slash core. And I uh, guarantee you will hear me talk about more than just Game Pass. Maybe we'll talk about Sony stuff this week. Ooh, I don't know. Maybe. And I'm really looking forward to Friday's thing as well. So check that out and get prepped. Cool. Also, a special thanks to Matthew Stevens. Matthew Stevens, you know who you are, but for everybody else, Matthew is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. And we want to thank Matthew for all the years of support. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Look, look, the folks who were new supporters yesterday, someday they'll be like Matthew. So you know what? Yeah. You you can start on the path to being like Matthew today. Thank you, Matthew, uh, for supporting us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Speaking of patrons, do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. What will we talk about today? You can also catch this show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow with Brian Brush for joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>